A lot of people ask us whether we understood what the internet was going to be when we started working on it in the 1970s. And uh, it's interesting to go back and figure out what we actually said back then. A lot of people have some revisionist thinking. They are, they're sure they knew what it was going to be. But if you look at what they actually wrote, you sometimes give a different answer. So some of us actually went back and tried to figure out what we wrote back then and where the history of these ideas actually emerged. The idea of this kind of network actually emerged in the 1960s. It's a fairly old idea. The idea of the computer as an empowering tool really arises in the 1940s. A man named Vannevar Bush in the 1940s wrote a paper called What Will Be, and he described a machine which was the size of a desk, and it was called a Memex, and you sat at it, and what was inside it was basically something that looks like the web. It was linked information. But missing from that was any vision of how my Memex could be hooked to your Memex. If I wanted to use your Memex, I went and sat at your desk. The idea that they could be hooked together is something that really happens in the mid-1960s. And I think the inhibition to the thinking was really just the rigidity and lack of innovation you see in the telephone system, where people really couldn't think their way past what the telephone companies were going to give you. So a lot of this was a revolution that also had to do with overthrowing the, the, the sort of mindset of the telephone companies. One of the real visionaries in this space was a man named J.C.R. Licklider. And he was um, a director at DARPA, which was the organization that built the first ARPANET. And he was one of the few people who really got it. And I think going in back and seeing what he wrote is a fascinating window into where we were in the 1960s. He wrote a wonderful paper with Robert Taylor in 1968 called The Computer as a Communication Device. And he said some wonderful things. He said, you will not send a letter or a telegram. You will simply identify the people whose files should be linked to yours and the parts to which they should be linked and perhaps specify a coefficient of urgency. You'll seldom make a telephone call. You'll ask the network to link your consoles together. You will seldom make a purely business trip because linking consoles will be so much more efficient. He was a little bit of an optimist there. He said, when people do their informational work at the console and through the network, Telecommunications will be as natural an extension of individual work as face-to-face -face communication is now. Life will be happier for the online individual because the people with whom one interacts more strongly will be selected by commonality of interest and goals than by accidents of proximity. Communication will be more effective and productive and therefore more enjoyable. There will be plenty of opportunities for everyone who can afford a console to find his calling. For the whole world of information, with all its fields and disciplines, will be open to him, with programs ready to guide him or her to help him explore. And then he had a very interesting summary. He said, for the society, the impact will be good or bad, depending mainly on the question of who will be online. Will being online a privilege or a right? If only a favored segment of the population gets a chance to enjoy the advantage of intelligence amplification, the network may exaggerate the discontinuities in the spectrum of intellectual opportunity. If, on the other hand, the network idea should prove to do for education what a few have envisioned and hoped, if not in concrete detailed plans, and if all minds should prove to be responsive, surely the boon to humankind will be beyond measure. Clearly he was an optimist. But this was a driving vision for all of the innovation that occurred in this country, the ARPANET, the internet, this vision really infected the engineers. But what's interesting is once the engineers got a hold, the visionaries went away. And if you look at the 70s and you look at the 80s, those are the decades of engineering. And if you look at the papers that were written in the 1970s and the 1980s, by and large, they had to do with the mechanics. Can I fit the programs in memory? Can I optimize the queuing? All of the engineering that goes on that helps us to build a network. And the visionaries sort of stepped off the stage for a couple decades. An important com component of what happened in the 1960s and 70s, of course, is in addition to hope and optimistic visions, there was an incredible amount of doubt and skepticism. A, a major source of doubt and skepticism was the uh, mindset of the traditional telephone companies who basically said 
first, it won't work, and second, if it does work, we're going to try to kill it because we're not interested in having something that competes with us, so why would we compete with us? I actually think that this doubt and skepticism was incredibly empowering because it basically meant they didn't pay attention to us. And as long as they didn't pay attention, then we could go do anything we wanted. So we built a network more or less over their dead body, but they couldn't stop us. In some sense, this is a classic example of what the, the, the business uh, community in particular, authors like Clay Christensen have called the innovator's dilemma, where some scrappy new entrant comes in and builds something. And obviously, when you first build it, it's not as good as what you have today. So everybody ignores you until all of a sudden you become big and powerful, and then you, you knock off the old uh, entrenched incumbent who then falls over and dies. So we sort of did a Clay Christensen on the telephone companies by building the internet. One of the questions is how soon we understood that not only were we engineering a technology, we were engineering a, an industry structure. How soon did people understand that? In fact, I don't think the internet community understood it as soon as some others. There was an alternative to the internet proposed in France by a man named Louis Pouzon. And in 1974, he made a, a most wonderful and articulate statement about the future of communications and the future of the communications industry structure. There was a controversy between two kinds of technology, one called datagrams and one called virtual circuits. The telephone companies liked virtual circuits, the internet community and Louis Pouzon's community liked datagrams. So he wrote, the controversy between datagrams and virtual circuits in public packet switching should be placed in its proper context. First, it's a technical issue where each side has arguments. It's hard to tell objectively what a balanced opinion should be since there's no unbiased expert. Second, the political significance of the controversy is much more fundamental as it signals ambushes in a power struggle between carriers and computer industry. Everybody knows that in the end, it means IBM versus telecommunications. Back then it was IBM, today it's somebody else. It may be tempting for some governments to let their carriers monopolize the data processing market as a way to control IBM. What may happen is that they fail in checking IBM, but succeed in destroying smaller industries. Another possible outcome is underdevelopment as for the telephone industry. It looks as if we need some sort of peacemaker. The interesting thing about Louis Pouzon and his own vision of the future is his development in France was effectively suppressed by France Telecom. Whereas in the United States, even though AT&T was completely skeptical, they didn't keep us from succeeding. It's tempting to try to predict the future by looking at technology or by looking at investment. The important thing to remember is that the ultimate driver of where the internet goes has been the user. They are the ones that picked email as the first dominant application, and they are the ones today that are deciding whether they would like to do internet messaging, they would like to do Skype, or they want to play games. Investment is a tremendously important factor, and of course you can't predict that either. It is not that the technologists are in charge of the future. It is the users, and it's the money. <laughs>